Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Carrillo. The original announcement of the phase three results for IVIG were negative. What did we learn today at the AAIC 2013 news briefing from the additional analyses and results presented at the conference? So the new results that were presented today um, really, uh, I think, underscore the importance of um, mining the data that uh, these clinical trials all produce, whether they are negative or positive. Unfortunately, these were not positive, um, but really learned so much about the different populations were used, the genetic differences, for example, in APOE4 carriers versus non-carriers, and also how biomarkers that were embedded into this study performed um, under the influence of a potential therapeutic agent, because we do not yet have enough information about how biomarkers perform. We don't know what to expect. And so all clinical trials that share that kind of information with the public, with the scientific community, make significant contributions. So is what we heard today that IVIG provided some positive results for a small subgroup of the participants and negative results for the rest of them? So I think it's important to understand that uh, Dr. Relkin was describing today sub-analyses, pre-specified analyses. So they were pre-planned, uh, but they're analyses that break out smaller populations, like the APOE4 carriers, um, so like the biomarker samples. But those are very small groups of people, so maybe 20, 30, um, I think as small as even 10. So I think it was very important that Dr. Relkin pointed out that there were differences in these populations, which tell us that there might be um, some room for future investigation of this treatment. It's not completely dead in the water, but he was very good about being cautious and saying we can't draw definitive conclusions about this drug based on these smaller analyses. They are generally too small to draw conclusions from. When Baxter made their initial top-line announcement about IVIG phase 3 trial earlier in the year, they announced that they were canceling the balance of the trials. Uh, what can you tell us about next steps in clinical trials for this drug. So this company, uh, Baxter, that really uh, co-sponsored this uh, drug trial with the Alzheimer's Disease Cooperative Study, which is an academic group around the country, uh, is uh, uh, considering right now, actually, based on these results that they've uh, presented at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference, uh, is considering whether they're going to keep going with this drug. Uh, I think the important thing to think about as well, though, is that there are other companies that are currently using IVIG in different ways, with different strategic approaches for Alzheimer's disease. So um, what we also presented during our press conference today was uh, that there are different ways of thinking about how IVIG actually affects Alzheimer's disease uh, and the brain changes associated. So it's got implications for tau. It has implications for inflammation. It has implications for, um, ray, um, for oxidative species and uh, free radicals, which we know are bad for our brain. So potentially can be neuroprotectant. So those are all very important to highlight because we still really Really don't understand the mechanism of action of this drug, and so that could potentially help us in the future continue to probably explore opportunities for IVIG. IVIG is already approved by the Food and Drug Administration for use in people primarily who have uh, problems with their immune systems. What special considerations are there when a drug that is already approved for one disease is being tested for another disease? So IVIG, uh, the clinical trial, was actually trying to use this uh, drug that is already approved by the FDA uh, for other uh, diseases uh, that, and trying to repurpose it. And repurposing just means using it for um, some other purpose than originally approved for. What we do need to consider is that it, this drug may not work in that other disease. And so for Alzheimer's disease specifically, um, it's important to understand that the FDA process for drug approval still has to be adhered to. It has to be a rigorous process. Um, it does, however, have the advantages of uh, repurposing, uh, helping us fast track because we already know how uh, a drug works in the body. We already know its safety considerations. Uh, we possibly know a little bit about dosing and how much drug should be given to a person. So that's all great news uh, and helps us fast track. But I think that uh, the results presented at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference by Dr. Relkin demonstrate the importance of actually trying to make sure it, it works in the different diseases.
used in the new disease that we're trying to test it in. And what we did see in this particular drug trial is that this drug did not demonstrate that it could improve the lives of people with Alzheimer's disease, their memories, um, and their activities of daily living, unfortunately. And Dr. Mary Sano on the panel did a great job uh, trying to stress the fact that the FDA process is actually out there for our protection uh, to make sure that vulnerable, pop vulnerable populations like people with Alzheimer's disease and other populations um, understand that they can't just go out and take drugs that are approved already and, and utilize them for Alzheimer's disease. So we definitely saw that, unfortunately, in this uh, drug trial, we can't use a IVIG for Alzheimer's disease at this time. Dr. Creel, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. It's great to be here.